Good evening. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but this is Matt Fleck, and we're going to be starting the uh, Professional Learning Community Webinar, PLC, for content in a few minutes. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or in the uh, question box, if you have either one of those. If you have any questions, we'll be glad to help you out, and we'll start just chance. Good morning. Welcome to the webinar. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Um, to check if the audio is working, would someone or one of you please just type in the message box or the question or chat box? Um, and Tom, if you're able to do that and see if my microphone is working okay, if it's volume or if you don't hear me, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, it sounds like uh, you hear me, but maybe just a little warble, <laughs> which is probably my voice this morning. So, um, again, we're going to be starting in just a few minutes, but I will um, gonna try another microphone before we get started so see if it'll work for audio. We will be starting the webinar for cosmetology teachers, professional learning. Yes, in a moment. I have changed my microphone for those of you who are uh, giving me mic checks. Thank you. Let me know if this is a better or worse. Appreciate it. Again, we'll start in a minute or two. Not looking any better, it sounds like. Okay. Give myself just a moment and see if I can increase the mi microphone. Number. Okay, we'll be starting our professional community in just a moment. Hopefully those of you who are, uh, listen, have been with us for the last couple of can hear me okay. We got, I know that I can a little bit for some of you. Don't know if the audio quality is, is uh, not, I'm not sure what the options are, but they're not very good. <laughs> to be honest, I have two microphones here, lots of, uh, lots of gear, but I'm not sure how to improve the quality. So hopefully it'll be fine. My name is Matt. I welcome you to Professional Community Art. This is our third one on model lessons. I know that the quality of my microphone is not the best. Unfortunately, for you all, uh, I'm not going to be able to speak. It's a thing. Hopefully, uh, we have a couple of uh, people speaking today, and hopefully you will be speaking as well uh, with your colleagues. So if uh, my microphone is very dry, I, I hope you'll bear with the couple as I give you the introductory information. Uh, and if you say my microphone is now, I apologize for the audio quality. But it's a computer, so you know, sometimes they work, and sometimes a little training, I guess. So again, I apologize for the audio quality. Welcome to this webinar. We have several people, teachers, cosmetology, uh, traders, uh, and others who are joining us. Um, let me give you just a little bit of information for all of you who are with us today. If you have some audio or technical difficulty, Tom Sudruth is with us. Uh, Tom can help you out if you do have questions. And to do so, just contact our phone number. That is 410-740-2006. And I believe it is number nine. If you press that number, you should be able to reach Tom to get some technical assistance. Again, that number is 410-740-2006. And press number nine, and that will give you some more help if you have questions or need technical assistance this morning. We have quite a few teachers with us. I'm so excited to see everyone with us this morning. 
We uh, promise to give you uh, as uh, high a quality of webinar as we can. And again, the quality of the webinar really depends on you sharing the information. I'm going to go through just a couple of slides, just to remind you for introduction. I'm going to open up the microphone for each of you one at a time and ask you just to say hello and introduce yourself. That will give us a chance to see if your microphone is getting better than mine, and also uh, to make sure that you're going to be able to join us um, again, probably for the conference, but when you're talking to each other. If you're at a place where more than one of you are in the room and you only, uh, when you're interested in this, if you would take a moment and eat in the chat box or in the question box, probably the question box would be best. Just type in the names of any other persons, whether teachers or administrators or others in the room. If you just have a record of who all on call, you have your name if you sign up in person registered. If you have someone else with you, again, just use the box and put in the name. And if you want to put a title, it would be great. So let me just go through a couple of introductory slides. I hope that you don't watch alongside of my screen. If you do, please let me know, and I will try to correct that. Yeah, we I've never been captain. I can in the cut the call. So it'll be like an audio slide. Just to let you know, you know that we have options for you today. Uh, if you have a computer, then we can use your phone. If you look on the right-hand side of your screen, the control panel will tell you if you want to use your microphone to call in so that we can talk with and listen to you. If you do speak, please turn the volume a little low. You'll go, well, you know, um, make sure you volume down so we can't hear you this morning. Uh, if you are able, under number two, to use an external headset and microphone to minimize the background noise, that would be very good. Again, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my audio. I don't know why, um, but uh, we'll bear with us as we can. Right. 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 that these webinars are uh, eligible to, uh, for ACT or ACT 48 credits. If you want to get those credits, um, you have to be at least involved in a minimum of webinars from one DLC group. You have to get within five days, within five days, the response form. We'll show you that in just a minute. Um, the attendance, number of hours, participation, I'll go back as you can see. We'll do that for you. And you can also request a report of your eligible hours. I think you can read the screen. I won't read repeat you and probably know that information as well. Let me show you a little bit of what the form looks like. I'm actually going to talk to you about this. You have filled these out before. If you have not, then we'll provide your email. I'll ask you to do that two days left. Go and put on the SUD website at the end of the webinar and you'll find business day. And we ask, we've got a back that have just had one or two sentences answered. And um, if you could do a little bit more, it doesn't have to be a, a book or a paper, just maybe uh, a paragraph to answer your questions, that would be fantastic. That's the introductory information. I'm going to open up the mics in just a moment to get into this discussion. We'll tell you two more things. First, we're going to model curriculum. As we have occasionally about the PLC, or National Learning Research, about this year. And we've talked in the past with college teachers about what you were teaching, what is your content, how it's to in Pennsylvania, uh, lesson plans, basics of the what, the big what, what you're teaching. Today, what we're going on is how students are learning, how women can at how to assess progress in class, how you determine if students are learning, maybe using formative or interim assessments, and readjusting your instruction or your method of instruction to provide extra help that students need it. And very important, I think, is helping students who aren't learning. Um, I'm sorry that the audio was so bad. Let me just uh, change to another microphone one more time and see if that's any better. Again, I apologize for the audio problems. Hold on just one second. This may not be any better at all, but we'll try it again and, and, and see. And again, I apologize if there are some audio problems for those of you. Um, I hope that this is a little bit better, but if not, please bear with us. Again, we'll be opening up the mic to talk this moment. Today is on assessing your progress and how you use interim or formative assessments to determine how well students are learning, and if they're not learning, what you can do to improve that. It's a little better, the audio, oh, goodness. Um, that's the rest of you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the attendees. You can probably see that on your screen somewhere. Um, and I'm going to unmute your microphone on your phone and see if you will take a moment to introduce yourself. I'll announce your name, and if you'll just uh, take a moment to introduce yourself and, uh, and if some information shared today, just let us know. Now, Amy, I don't know if the microphone works, but I unmuted you. Can you introduce yourself, Amy? Amy Bush? I'm not sure we have your microphone working, so I'll put that back on. Uh, Daryl Olson, are you this one? Daryl, I can hear a, it sounds like from the background. Hello? Great. Thanks, Cheryl. I can, can you hear me? It's probably cutting in and out a little bit, isn't it? I'm not sure why that connection your is that way. Your voice is very distorted. So it's in. I'm with the Fayette County. Yes, Fayette I understand. I, uh, I, great. I'm here with our Thanks, Cheryl. It's probably... Sorry to interrupt. Tell me again who you're with. Uh, Mr. Grove, our math coach here in our building. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Sheriff. I apologize for the odd problems. I hear it when you respond how it tumbles down to my talk, in and out. Thank you, Sheriff. Looks like Steve Franklin. Christine, can you hear us? Can you introduce yourself? I can't hear anything that you're saying. Can't hear anything I'm saying. Okay. Well, Christine, can you, can you hear me enough to, to introduce yourself? I'm Christine Franklin from Cumberland Harry Votech, Mechanicsburg. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, again, apologize for the audio. I'm not sure if the, the go-to webinar site, we'll talk with them about what audio is available. Thank you, Chris, for digital. Is that correct, Denise? Can you hear me? Okay. Denise wrote in the chat box that she's having some audio difficulty. Well, thank you very much for being with us. So we'll try to get you through the question box. Glenn, Isaac, are you in, uh, available? Say hello. Okay. So Cheryl tells me that everybody can hear everybody else except for me. So that's what we should up here at home. Uh, Juliet Skowski, is that good? Juliet, can you hear Hello. Okay. Uh, Kathleen Houghton is with us, or Houghton. Uh, Kathleen, can you, can you hear me? Want to say hello? Uh, yeah, this is Kathy Houghton. I'm from the Technical College High School uh, in, on the Pennax Bridge campus. Um, I can hear everyone who speaks, but I, not, I cannot hear you. You're going in and out. Okay. Well, I apologize. Uh, thank you, Kathy. That's information. Oh, um, I don't know if I have anything electronic around here that else that I can get into this computer <laughs> to make it work better. But we'll get around. Um, again, I'll stop talking here in just a moment. Uh, is it Lisa? Can you hear me? Good. I'm muted. Can you say hello? Excuse me? I, no, I apologize. Well, maybe we'll stop here in a moment. You'll stand us. Maybe I will try and in. Maybe that will work out a bit better. Um, let me go ahead and show you that option that I have. Um, Tom, I'm going to introduce you for a moment. Can you introduce Tom? Tom Sudrath, yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Check your time. Are you with us this morning? Microphone, Marshall. Are you with us this morning? Can you tell? Okay. I think you're talking to me because I got a message that I'm technology. Yes. Can you hear me? I, I can. Said, yeah. I'm sorry that you can't hear me. Oh, because it's a technology. It's such a. I don't know if any of you can hear me well enough. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think this is conducive to a good webinar. So. Well, let me just have a on the screen so those of you who uh, can't hear very well can at least uh, go ahead just type it up. Maybe we can redo this a little bit. We'll have to schedule this now because the video is certainly not working well enough. Um, you see if I'm going to be to a telephone and uh, we'll be one moment. I will call. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. I am um, trying to do you now by phone, and I am going to ask if you would all put in your question box whether or not you can hear me. If this is clearer or, or worse, a little let me know. Uh, let me know. If we need to reschedule, we can. Oh, there's one. Kathy says yes, you can hear me now. Much better. Great. I again apologize for all the problems that we're having. It is um, frustrating, as you all know, how things work that way. Okay. Well, um, what I'm going to do, good, I'm glad you can hear me much better. Um, I'm going to have to do just a little bit different for my uh, headphones, but um, what we'll do is we'll skip for right now the introduction portion. Um, let me put in just very quickly an earpiece so that I can hear any of you who are speaking. We'll just take a moment to um, unmute a couple more microphones from people and see if we can and get a few more introductions. Okay, let's see if your microphones are working. Mabel, um, I unmuted your microphone. Are you with us this morning, Mabel? Mabel Faust, Purple? Can you hear me, Mabel? Okay, Marcia, uh, I'm coming back to you. Can you reintroduce yourself? Uh, you said that you've heard me. Can you hear me a little bit better now, Marcia Sand? I do hear you a little. A little better. This is Marcia Sant 
from Career Institute of Technology in Easton. Fantastic. And Marcia, we may be coming back to you in just a moment to um, uh, help you start us off on some of the conversation, if that's okay with you. Would that be appropriate? <laughs> sure. Sure. Put you on the spot. Thanks, Marcia. Be right back to you. Um, I think we tried Mary Heim. Mary, can we hear you now? Can you talk a little bit? Let's see if your microphone works. Okay. Let's go to Melissa. Melissa Chapman. Is your microphone yeah. working? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, um, sounds like Melissa, Melissa Chapman, York County School of Technology. Fantastic. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Michelle Werney, are you with us this morning? Can we hear you? Okay. Great. How about Mike? Mike Curley, are you with us this morning? You have a microphone, you can say hello. Uh, yes. Uh, y yes, we're here. I, can you hear me? I'm also here with Lamar Snyder at Swenson Skill Center. Fantastic. We can hear you, Mike. Welcome to you and Lamar. Appreciate it. How about Trisha Adams? Trisha, can you say hello? Yes, I'm here also. Fantastic. Anyone else with you? Nope, all by myself. All by yourself. Okay. <laughs> we'll take care of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Lee. Good morning. Uh, I'm here, uh, and I'm alone. <laughs> You're alone. All right. Well, again, we'll take care of that. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate that. Are you? Uh, what's your What's your role? I'm the director for Berks Career and Technology Center. Fantastic. Thank you very much. How about uh, Sandra Zulit? Is that correct, Sandra? Can you hear me? And can you say hello? Yes, that's correct. My name is Sandra Zulit from the Indiana County Technology Center. Fantastic. Uh, Sharon, is it Sharon Dealing? It's right. actually Dialing. Dialing, okay. Dialing from Sharon. Dawson County Technical School. Fantastic. And you're the cosmetology teacher there? No, I am a math coach here. Our cosmetology teacher is out for a couple of weeks for surgery. Oh, boy. Okay. I hope she's doing well. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you. Uh, Stu Stewart, can you introduce yourself this morning if you're on the microphone? Yes. Can you hear me? You can. Good. Um, I was having problems this morning, but I'm Sue Stewart from Forbes Road East Vocational Technical School, and I'm by myself also. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I, should, I shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be by yourself. And <laughs> isn't it? Great. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, how about Tracy Scholl? Tracy, are you there this morning? Can we hear you? Good morning. I'm here. Um, I am from Brooks Career and Technology Center. I'm joined by my coworker Donna Noecker, and also my Principal Dr. Kraft. Fantastic. And we'll be coming back to Donna here in just a moment if she's uh, willing to, to kind of start us off. So tell her to get ready. She's ready. Okay. Good deal. Thank you very much. And uh, one more, I think, uh, Bonnie Skinner. Bonnie, did, you, did I check to see if you were with us? No, Can not yet. Hello? Okay. Sorry about that. Can you say That's hello? Okay. Introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Bonnie Skinner. I'm from Jeff Tech. I'm a cosmetology instructor. Great. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, again, thank you very much for all of you who, um, who um, what, what's the, the, uh, the way to say it, bared with us, bore with us uh, through our technical difficulties. Hope it's a little bit better on audio. You know, this technology thing has not all been worked out completely, has it? Again, today we're going to be talking about how you assess the uh, progress of your students in your area, and especially in cosmetology. And so I'm going to go to um, Donna, and uh, Donna Necker, I believe it is, and you might have to tell me a little bit better your pronunciation of your name, Donna. And then um, I'm going to open up your microphone there. And would you head us off with and talk a little bit about what you do to help and how you assess student progress in your classes? Um, I assess student progress in a variety of ways. And as, a, as instructors, we're assessing our students as soon as they walk through the door. When they're coming into the classroom, you're looking to see if they're in a good mood, if they're ready to learn. If they're upset, maybe you need to focus on that student a little bit more to make sure the learning process is taking effect on them. And if you're using the MAX teaching strategies, there's a variety of formative assessments in there that you can be using with the students, right as from a level one all the way up to level three. So when it does come time for that NOCD exam, that they're going to be well prepared. I did send you a couple of um, things that I'm using. Some formative assessments, if you could bring some of them up. Sure. And you tell me which ones you want, and I'll try to pull them up. Um, if you can bring up the uh, anticipation guide for electricity. 
Can you see that without the boxes in front of it there, Donna? Um, Are there? It's okay. It's okay. That's the salon one. I can start with that one, though. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Anticipation guides. Is there anybody else out there that are using the anticipation guides? If you are, just raise your put a put a hand raise, and we'll um, we'll identify you for for Donna. Looks like we have a couple, Donna. Um, okay. An anticipation guide is something that I really do like to use because it not only gives you some information about what the students are picking up as you're teaching your lesson, it's also preparing them before you start the lesson to get ready to learn. So when they go in to read the text, they're not reading unmindfully. They're going in, they look at the statements first, they go in and they read the text, so they're reading with a purpose, and if somebody's reading with a purpose, they're going to retain the information much more than if they're just doing a hunt and search for some questions that are scattered throughout the chapter. And when you're creating your anticipation guides, it's really important that when you create the questions, your statements, that you're not pulling statements directly out of the book so that that way they can hunt and search. You don't want them to do that. You want to make sure that your statements are in your own words so that they do need to read the information and they do need to summarize their own information. And also what's nice is there's not a lot of writing with the anticipation guides. The students don't shut down because they only have to mark whether they agree somewhat agree or they disagree. And then they're, they're going to mark that before they read. Then after they're reading, they're going to mark whether their level of agreement has changed. And all they have to do is write down the page number and the paragraph number. Then they're going to discuss with their peers the information that they put to see if they can change each other's mind or if they actually agree with the information. Then you have a whole class discussion. And by doing this, you can assess whether learning is taking effect. So I do like the anticipation guide. So if you can bring my other anticipation guide up, just to show another format, that's let the one on electricity. I, sure, let me see if I can do that. Uh, is it, was it labeled anticipation guide, Donna? I'm sorry. Oh, maybe this? I can't see them. Nope, not that one. Not that one? All right. I have electricity, I have color, foiling, perm. Um, that's the only ones I have right now. Try the one on the far right. This one? Maybe one. Electricity? There you go, that's it. Okay. okay. And this is just a different, well, I thought I put a different format up. I apologize, because there are different formats that you can use for anticipation guides. And um, by changing the format of your anticipation guide, then you won't hear from the students, oh, we've done this before. Do we have to do this again? So if you make it look different, because there are a few different templates out there, if you search through the internet or look through your Max teaching book, that you can make it look like it's something different, a different activity, even though it's the same. The students just don't realize it. So the anticipation guides, like I said, are really good to use, and you can use them in a variety of ways. OK, if you can go to um, the Nazi topic of the week. Okay. You did it. You just had it. I did? I think so. Yeah. You did. It has a picture at the top of it. Oh, okay. There we go. Would it be that one? Should okay. be coming up here shortly. There you go. That's it. Okay. Okay. This is something that Mrs. Scholl and I have started to do in our classroom. And we made a bulletin board up. And on the bulletin board, we put the knocky topic. And then we'll put three questions on that the students have to write on their paper. And that's for the week. They have to turn it in by the end of the week. And this is worth 15 points. So they're going to write their topic down, put their question, then they'll answer their question. But after they answer their question, then we've incorporated a writing strategy where they have to explain why that's the answer. And again, by doing the explanation and connecting it to a why, it's going to be something that the students remember. And so every week we'll be putting new ones up. And then we're hoping that at the end, after we've gone through most of the topics, that they'll have a nice collection that they can keep in their notebook or their portfolio in a good safe place that they'll have a lot of review sheets so before a NOCTI time comes they'll be able to go through these and be more prepared for the final test of the NOCTI. So, can I interrupt you just a moment? Uh, we have a couple questions. Christine asked um, if you could share these online and Tammy is wondering if these materials are online or if they could have access to them. Um, I made this sheet and I can send this sheet out to everybody if you would like. Hans, maybe you can send those out since you already have them. 
Yeah, we can uh, we can send those out to all the participants today. That would be great. Um, are you able to put them on the SAS website as well, Donna, or, or does that take a little bit too much time? We can see, certainly send them out immediately. Dr. Kraft said that we can do that. Okay. So let's um, we'll send these out today after the uh, the webinar, and uh, we'll have the other ones online. So that's fantastic. And just to follow up, Christine uh, Franklin asks if you can ex give an example of a Nazi topic question. Um, sanitation is one that we just starting with, and we just start out with some simple questions like, how often does the client's towel have to be changed? Um, why do we have to use a Sanic around the neck? So just some simple questions, you know, to follow through with sanitation and sterilization because we know that's a big topic with not only NOFTI but also with state boards. So we'll start out simple and then get more complex as to we, you know, as we start going through. Great. Just a reminder to those of you who are listening. I know it um, doesn't sound like you're able to participate audibly, but if you raise your hand, I'll um, unmute your microphone and we'll let you ask your question directly to Donna if you want to. Great. Donna, what else would you like me to show? Um, you can go on to the modalities. It's called Go Find It. I think it's the one with the two blue. There. Thank you. I can go visually, so that helps. Right, that's it. Okay, this is something that I started doing with my students, and they do enjoy it. Um, I, have, I put the answers in the one that I have set up with you, but the one that I have is blank. It doesn't have anything in the boxes. And what I'll do is I'll tell the students, like when we're working on electricity, that there are two main modalities used in cosmetology, but I won't tell them what they are or where they are in the textbook. It's their job to go in and find it. And then I'll have some kind of reward for the first person that finds it, like some chocolate kisses or something like that. So then they'll go in and they'll find the two topics, and that would be the galvanic current and the TELSA high frequency current. After they go find the, the two types of current, then they need to go in and go write some important facts about each one. And again, they won't just write those facts and stop. They'll go with their partner, they'll discuss, they'll make sure that they all have the information, and then as a class we'll go through and we'll present the information to each other. So this is another way that the students can connect the work and remember it better. So we have a question from uh, Stacy Rudy. Uh, Stacy, I'm not sure that we have audio for you, so if you would just use the question box and type in your question and we'll allow you to ask it that way. Donna, is this a common uh, way for uh, doing the modalities, or did you adapt this from something else or create this all on your own? Um, I was at a conference one time, and I heard another instructor talking about doing a Go Find It activity, so I just went in and created this myself using the, sh the, um, the graphs inside the Word in Word. I also do it with um, the three different types of lighteners. I put two circles at the top of the page, and then I'll have them go in and find the three different types of lightener the oil, the cream, and the powder, and then they'll have to list me information about each type of lightener. But it's kind of like a contest, because whoever gets it first is going to get the treat. And the students, I assume, are very engaged in this? It's yes, they, kind of they are. They, like it, they do like it a lot. How many of these do you have, these sheets? Like Actually, this? I only have the two. I have the, the electricity and the one for the lighteners. Stacy's question, she typed it in the question box. Thanks, Stacy. She said, do you use the NACI weekly questions with all levels of students? Yes, we're using it with all levels of students. We're going to use it with all levels as Mrs. Scholl gets done doing a topic. We're going to do it after that topic with her students, but it's also a good review then for my students. But then when we get to an area that her students do not do, then she can get more in depth with her NACI questions of the week for the topics that she's already covered with her students, and then I'll move on to asking some questions with hair coloring and relaxing, you know, topics that her students don't do. This looks very good. I think you've got some um, receptive uh, other teachers with us this morning. So that's wonderful. Okay. You want to show um, us some other? Um, pull up the not the color thing pair share. All right. This is now. something I like Think Pair Share a lot. I know a lot of the other things that we do, even with the anticipation guide, is Think Pair Share because the students are thinking on their own, sharing with each other, and then presenting to the class. With the uh, Go Find It, again, it's Think Pair Share. So, er, er, that whole falls into a lot of different categories. But this here, the Nocti Color Think Pair Share, I've um, put some prompts 
inside the boxes. And these prompts are kind of more in-depth to really get the kids to thinking like why they have to do things and how they have to do things and what's the purpose of it. So they'll put down their thoughts and then again they'll be partnered with a partner and then they're going to write down what their partner thought and then I'll put them into groups and the group's going to discuss, depending on how many students I have, I might sign each group three of those areas and then they're going to present to the class all the information that they've you know, found while I facilitate it and make sure if they missed anything that I fill in the blanks. And think pair share with the prompts can be done when you start a chapter. You can put some easy prompts in there. Again, like an anticipation guide, it's giving the students a reason to read so they have some information before they go in to read. And you can make them more complex when it's something that the students have already done, such as hair color, my students, and then they have to really do some critical thinking with it. Does anybody else have any think pair shares that they use the different formats that they would use? Because I'm always looking for new things also. Yeah, good. Yeah, Donna could use your input as well here. So remember, as, as she's talking or as you're thinking of it, you can always type a question into the question box. And then when she's at a break, we'll um, ask the question. Or you can click the little hand icon to raise your hand if you have a question. And we'll unmute your microphone and you can ask. Uh, Donna, that question directly. Does anyone else use Think, Pair, Share or do any activities similar to this in their the classrooms? And as we're getting an answer to that, uh, do you, so each uh, pair, one of the persons from each pair then reports out when you're trying to assess? Uh, it depends on if it's, if it's very complex, then I'll have it like this one here. I would have them share with a part, but I would put them in the groups. They first they would share with a the partner, then they would go into the groups, and then the whole group would present out the information. If it's something more simple when we're starting in the beginning of a chapter and I just have a few things, then it would just be the individual person writing what they thought and then their partner and then coming up with their super statement. Great. And how often do you do this? The think pair shares I try to do quite often. I, I do a variety of things. I like to change it up because if I keep doing the same thing then the kids seem to get bored. They're like, they always say, like, we've already done this before. Do we have to do it again? So that's why I try to change everything that I'm doing. Does it help you assess their learning? Would you get some good information back to you? Or do you sometimes think, well, you kind of knew this already? Well, no, it, it really helps give me some information, especially with this, because they're asking, like, what is a filler? What is the purpose of the filler? When is the filler applied and how? So when they're answering those things and they're giving me all, those an all the information that I need, it's letting me know. So it's my formative assessment as to whether they really understand the information. Because even with oral questioning, like when your students come up to you and they bring you, say, a first time hair color, they may apply it correctly to the mannequin, but that doesn't mean that they understand why they did it that way. You know, so I'll ask them, you know, what did you do? And they'll say, I sectioned it into four. Then I'll ask them, how did you apply it to the strand? And they'll say, a half an inch away from the scalp and a half an inch away from the ends. But why did you do that? So they need to tell me why they applied it away from the scalp, why they applied it away from the ends. When did they go back and apply it to the scalp and the ends? You know, so there's all, even with just oral questioning, when they're doing some hands-on tasks, that's, again, formative assessment. We're doing formative assessments all the time, I think, all day long with our students. We just don't call it that. Exactly right. Um, Julianne I has a question. Uh, Julianne, do you mind if I unmute your, your phone? I don't know if you can talk. Can you, can you ask the question through your phone? Uh, I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to, everybody was asking, do you do a think, pair, share? Well, not exactly that format, but we do the KWL as an anticipation type of, of uh, strategy for literacy. So the students, what they do is they just write down uh, what they know, or at least what they think they know, and then what they want to learn and if they actually learned it uh, upon fruition of the lesson. So, and, and then we, we do that. And, and they have the opportunity to ask questions in between and we know if they actually learn something because it'll be evident as they try to execute that skill. And I think that's actually very helpful when you do formative assessment. Yes. Donna, do you use KWL? I use KWL, which is a form of a graphic organizer, and I also use Venn diagrams as a form of a graphic organizer. And a Venn diagram I would use, again, with like a first-time color, and they could compare and contrast, you know, first-time color going darker, first-time color going lighter, 
And then, of course, in that center part of the Venn diagram, they would be putting what's the same, and then on the outside, you know, what's different. Great. I, I use that as well, and also that's very useful. Say you're doing perming. And uh -huh. all, all perming, you're breaking your chemical bonds, and, and you're trying to curl the hair, but maybe using an exothermic perm or an endothermic perm. And, and when you go into the classifications, it's also very useful. I, I agree the Venn diagram is, a, is also another great strategy. Thank you. Great. What else can we show, Donna? A couple other items? Um, I think the next thing I have on there is rubrics. I have Nocti perm and Nocti foiling. How about if we start with the Nocti perm wrap? It should be okay. coming up here shortly. Um, it's just a rubric going through all the different steps that the students would have to do when they're taking their Nocti exam. And what I'll do is I'll give them the rubric and they'll look over it and they'll practice it first using the rubric, making sure that they're following all the steps and meeting all the criteria. And then on another day, they'll practice the perm wrap again, but they won't use the rubric. They'll have to do everything by memory, and then I'll go through and I'll look at all their mannequins and then rate them up until a five. But if you notice on the instructions, I put that they have to reach a four or above because I want them to reach that advanced level on NACTI. I don't want it to just to be satisfactory at a number three. So I have them strive for the higher numbers. So I just have the criteria on this. And the same thing with the foiling. It's just you know, a rubric listing all the criteria for the foiling. Same idea. They practice it by themselves with the rubric first, and then again without the rubric, and then I rate them. And not all formative assessments have to be given a grade number. Sometimes you can just give them a, a star stamp or a smiley face or a wow or a that's wonderful. You know, those stickers and stamps that you can put on. And instead of giving them a grade, you give them a good pat on the back. And students love to work for pats on the back. Sure do. Uh, Kathy Houghton asked, do they get to keep the practice rubric so they can study from it? Um, they can keep the practice rubric, yes. But then they have to have it put away. They can't have it out on the day that we do it without the rubric. Fantastic. And how often do you do this? I do this with every hands-on Nocti. I want to ask everyone uh, this question, and, but I'm going to start with you, Donna, because you, you have the microphone, of course. Uh, what do you do when students are struggling? I know everybody has their own techniques, but if you get a student who's consistently in the one or two uh, area on the rubric, what do, you, what do you do? Well, I'll try and watch them and see what they're doing so I can help them and see what it is they're actually doing not correctly. Or if I have another student that really excels, I'll have that student work with the student that's not doing so well and practice the technique over and over until she finally comes to the level that we want her to be. That's terrific. That's great. Um, Mary, uh, hi, Amanda. I'm going to unmute your microphone. Mary, do you want to ask a question? <laughs> Mary, are you there? Do you want to ask a question to Donna? Mary had her hand up. Maybe that was just accidental. Okay. So All right. The next thing you can put up then, I guess, would be the the regular test that I have on there, the infection control. Okay. Let's see. I may not have that one. Would that be? Oh, no, maybe I didn't send that one. I might have just printed it out. Okay. I can just talk about it. Okay. Well, everybody here is a cosmetologist, so you should have the Milady test generator. If you have the Milady test generator, could you just raise your hand that I know that you have that? I don't know if they're raising that hand. We've got, can you see the hand raises, Don? No, I can't. OK, so it looks like um, Denise and Lisa, Mabel, um, maybe Mary, although she had her hand up earlier, Sandra, Sue, Tammy, several of them say that they do have that. OK, well, what I'll do is I'll have the generator, and I'll make a test, and I'll print it out. And the one I have in front of me is infection control. And I'll have the students go through this test, and they'll answer the questions. And then I have them work with a partner again, think, pair, share. And they'll compare their answers and see you know, where they're different. Once they find out where they're different, then they'll go into the textbook, and they'll make sure they have all the correct answers. So after they go through the activity and they know that they have all the correct answers, they can use this as a study sheet. You can go into the test generator. You can scramble everything and make a new test 
with most of the same information, just not in the same format that they couldn't memorize the answers. And then you could give them your final assessment as to whether they remembered the information or not. But again, it would be a formative assessment when they were going through it the first time, answering by themselves. You could see what they remembered, working with a partner, sharing that information, and then hopefully retaining the information for the final test. So is like anybody you. else using the test generator this way? Anybody else using the test generator? I'm going to open up Bonnie's uh, microphone. I don't know if she has a comment on that. But Bonnie, did you have a comment about something else Donna, Donna was saying? No, I'm sorry. I'm just having problems with my mic here. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. You ask a question, Donna, if anybody else is using the test generator. Um, I don't know, Melissa, if you are answering that question, but Melissa, I've unmuted your, or unmuted your microphone. Did you want to comment on that? Hi. Um, I don't know if the other teachers have access to Moodle, but we have access to Moodle here, and with Moodle you can put in multiple choice questions, and you can randomize them yourself. And the beauty of it is, is um, you can randomize the questions and the ABCD choices when the students do actually take the test, it immediately corrects it, and you can walk around and see which ones they missed and talk to them about the ones they missed. Uh, you can set it up as a review if you want to have them review ahead of time, and they can practice that anytime at home in the evening or on weekends or in school if they have the time and access to computers. And the other thing I really like about it is you can make a midterm so that you can go in and see um, questions out of each of the different areas and then you can put together a midterm that's made up of different subject matter and uh, again it, it corrects it for you right away and, and you can see where your students weaknesses are and where they are doing really well. Um, it takes some time to load the questions in but once they're in they're in and then you never really have to deal with it again unless they make an update to the Milady text and then you need to go in and make changes it's a good tool for the students to help you put in because they are actually learning while they're typing in questions and answers as well. And where did you get Moodle? Is it just something Our school has it for available for the teachers. It's um, a program called Moodle and it, it's, it's a great tool. There's some other really cool things that I can use it for like um, they can read a document and then they can type in a, an essay response to the document and you can, you can check that a lot of different activities that can be done. The great use of, of Moodle, Melissa, yeah, it's a very useful tool. Uh, Tammy Wagler says Moodle is a wonderful tool. We have had it now for over two years. So there's a couple others. I don't know if anybody else wanted to make a comment in the box about that, but it's great to have. I never heard of it. Yeah. And uh, we had a question from Marsha. Um, Donna, could you spell the name of the test that you were talking about? The name of the test? Yeah. In fact, so the test. Yeah, I think you were talking about test generator, maybe. Test generator. Maybe that was what you were referring to. Oh, it's through Milady. You can order it with their software. Okay. It's Milady. It, yeah, Milady. Okay. That's the name of our textbook and they have the software for the test generator. Okay. Tammy says maybe exam view is the like quote unquote name of it perhaps? It's maybe. called test generator. It's called test generator. Test generator. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And just a reference to Moodle. Moodle is M-O-O, -O, like a cow, moo, M-O-O-D-L-E. It's actually, um, I think the, the software itself is free, but it typically takes some sort of a technology specialist to make sure it runs on your school computer. So you might check if you have an IT person or somebody with a computer specialist at your school if you can get access to Moodle there. Uh, Tom, that Christine asked, does anyone use pivot point text? I don't know if anybody, if you, if you do use pivot point, maybe you could put, raise your hand in the uh, attendee list or the raised hand box. It's on the right hand side there. And uh, Marcia, thanks you, Donna, because she couldn't hear it initially. So she appreciated that you talked about that. Um, so pivot point text, it looks like Karen McGuire uses that. And maybe Sue Stewart. Do, uh, Sue, do you want to talk a little bit about, about pivot point or say anything about it? I've unmuted your mic. 
Well, Pivot Point um, has the same type of test generator with it, with their software, uh, very similar to Milady's. So um, it can be so used have, the very same way. So if you don't have Milady, then maybe you can use that one. Yeah, it, it works. So it works the same way. Wonderful. And, and Cheryl Olson had her hand up. Cheryl, did you want to make a comment about Pivot Point or something else? I also use the uh, Pivot Point in my classroom, and even our workbooks are all designed and set up with rubrics for each task that they're, you know, expected to learn throughout the, the cosmetology program. Okay. Great. Um, uh, Chris, Christine, I'm going to mute your microphone. You had a question about Pivot Point. Did you, can you, does your microphone work? You can just ask it that way. Uh, well, I'm just trying to incorporate that into our classroom. So I'm trying to not, I'm trying to learn how to maybe let go of the My Lady and just use the Pivot Point because I like how the Pivot Point workbook has a lot of higher order thinking skills in it and along with what someone else just mentioned as far as the rubrics were concerned. I didn't know what other software I might need. Donna, would you have any idea um, other software that, that Christine might need for that? Um, other software from a lady? They have the test generator, um, the course management book. No, I just meant the pivot point. We don't oh, use, we don't use pivot point, we use Milady. I don't know if anybody who uh, uses Pivot Point has any suggestions on that. We can, let's see if we can find out some more information on that. Um, just so you know, Donna, Lisa says she uses the Milady test ge uh, generator, and um, a couple of others say they use Moodle and like that as well. So very helpful. Wonderful. If you have a question that I'm not getting to, please uh, just raise, put your, put your hand up, you know, the, the technical way. <laughs> Like in class with it, please raise your hand or just put a question in the question box and we'll be glad to answer it. Donna, I appreciate your, the time and, and uh, the energy you put in sending me all these documents. This is really very helpful information. We appreciate You're it welcome. very much. Yeah. I'm going to give you a, a chance to break. I think I told you you only had to talk for like five or ten minutes and, and I, I've made you talk longer, but I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to switch just real quick to, to Marsha. I, I told, I warned Marsha that I might be coming to her and uh, asking her a couple of questions. Um, Marsha, are you there? Can you still um, hear us? Yes, I'm here. Great. Did, did you want to talk about um, active expressions or the Promethean board? Well, we have Promethean boards, which we are still in the learning process of it. And um, I'm a paper and pencil girl, so I'm learning slower, I think. <laughs> It's fun. Um, what we've done with uh, recognizing the parts of the shears and the razor is we have the picture up on the Promethean board and the student can come up with the pen and find the word and take it to the correct part of the shear. And if it's not correct, it bounces away from it. If it is correct, it stays there. So um, that's a nice idea that we do with that. That's just one of them. The other one we do with bugs, and the student has a little doodle bug, which they can um, enter their answer and send it to me. So we um, pre-enter questions as review questions in the format of uh, multiple choice, usually, usually multiple choice, because that's the state board exam. And the student, then we read the question. It's all up on the board that the whole class sees and they enter their response. And it shows on a little graph, not by name, but by number of the doodle bug, what their answer is. And then it gives them a percentage against the class, like how well they did. So um, yeah, they do end up learning each other's number. So it's not completely secretive to uh, hurt somebody's self-esteem. But the kids seem to like it, because it's like texting. Um, again, I haven't used it on every chapter, but it's a work in progress. We're all learning. Um, I do pretty much of what um, I think it's Donna was talking with the question and answer. I, I feel better with the actual oral question and answer. It takes me a while, but I have other activities for the rest of the class to do. But when you're one-on-one -on -one with the student 
and they're looking at you and they have to answer what you're asking, you really if they know it or not. So um, I like the oral questioning. We do the KWL. We do uh, Venn diagram. I've done that also. And um, we do the rubrics. I hand that paper out to them as a guide for themselves, but I like Donna's idea where she has them on the station the first time and then the second time without the rubric. Um, I think I might implement that. That's a good idea. And I don't know about this noodle, so I guess I'm going to find out about that. That's great. Yeah, this is one of the better um, better ways to find out about things by sharing with your other with your colleagues. Right. right. Now, um, Active Expressions and the Promethean Board, are those both software programs, I, I, I guess? Um, well, it's the whole, the Promethean Board. It's like that big white board that you, like the, uh, the weather people use on TV, and they oh. get all their cute little diagrams and all that. I mean, there is so much you can do with it, but we, I'm really at baby steps with it. Um, I like it. It's neat. It's great when technology works, as we saw today. <laughs> right. Um, you have to have plan B and C, but or D, E, and F sometimes. Um, but I think if you're used to teaching, you can pull something out of your hat to continue on. I did let them take my whiteboard away. I can still write my notes on the board. And I use my Promethean board for my um, lectures. Like I have everything in a PowerPoint on there, and there's I can actually write on the Promethean board if I have something else to, to add to it. Wonderful. It's a pretty neat uh, board. Yeah. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to get to Melissa in just a moment um, to ask, and I'm going to unmute her microphone in just a moment. But Christine Franklin says, um, it sounds like it's kind of a type of smart board. Can you, can you spell Promethean? Yeah. yeah, it's a smart board. Promethean, P-R-O-M-E-T-H-E-A-N. It's a smart board. I think it's just, I think that's the brand name, but I think um, when we receive this, they explain that it's like a step above the whiteboard, or the smart board, I'm sorry. The smarter board. Yeah, the smarter <laughs> board. <laughs> You're right. We yeah, just need right. to be smarter to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, I thought you did your microphone. Did you have a question for Marsha? Oh. I was just going to make two other comments, if that's okay. Um, the, we have the Promethean board as well, and I use the ActiVotes, and um, I have a little bit older model, I think. And um, we, I really like that as a tool for the first-time review of a test, because I teach the level one students. It's a great discussion tool, because you put the question up there, and they come up with an answer, and you can look at the choices and say why A isn't right or B isn't right. And a lot of times with our questions, it comes down to two of the choices. It's like it's either A or B. You can usually cross out one. It's ridiculous. But um, it, it's a great discussion tool to review tests. And the other thing is if you don't have technology, an, an older method, and I still use it even though I have the technology, is just taking the test questions out of the Milady exam review and copying them on one side of paper and then um, writing the answer on the back. And you can throw them into Ziploc bags and have your, group, your students into groups of two or four. They can pull a question out, ask the partner the question, and then they can check the answer on the back. And that's always an easy way to help some students review. Hey, Melissa, that's a good idea. If you could turn down your volume on your computer a little oh, I'm bit sorry. and provide a bit of feedback. We, I think some people may have missed a little bit of the, the last part of that. But good information. Do you want to just repeat the very last piece that you mentioned? Yeah, sorry, I'm using my daughter's computer and I can't figure out how to turn it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Wait a minute, let me try. There's a little icon like, she has an apple. Anybody have an apple? Let me try this. Let me try it on this. On the set. Is that better? Um, no, I think it's still got a bit of feedback. <laughs> I actually hear her very well. Oh. Okay. Well, if the rest of you heard it, that's fine. That's great. Good. Good. Thank you, Melissa, for sharing on that. And, and I wanted to unmute, or unmute uh, Sue Stewart. Sue, did you have a comment you wanted to make? 
Well, it was um, about the pivot point when they were asking questions about that text. And um, pivot point has a lot of supplementary material. And also, not only do they have the rubrics, but they have a theory CD with interactive PowerPoints on it that you can purchase. Great. So a lot of the a lot of the about tools that you're using, software and hardware. Anybody else that's using tools that are similar? I'll, I'll get back to you, Marsha. I just wanted to while we have it. Uh, Chris, okay. I'm going to unmute your microphone. Did you want to say make a comment? I just want to know what the theory CD was called for the pivot point. Do you know that, Marsha? On pivot point, I'm not sure. Uh, no, I don't else. use pivot point. I use Milady. Okay. If anybody uses uh, Pivot Point, well, if you want to weigh in, um, so we'll try to get that. Christine, you did you also want the name of um, where, where Karen McGuire and Sue Stewart where they're where they're working at? Is that right? Yes, please. Okay, good. So if you could enter that, uh, Karen and Sue, what what school you're with, and just put that in the question box, and we'll we'll get that to everybody else. Um, Lisa says that foldable study guide. Uh, she uses construction paper, fold and cut in different areas to create an advanced flashcard, which is really creative. Tracy says, um, is it possible, Melissa, to give us access to your Moodle? Um, let's, let me unmute your microphone here. I don't know if did you want to make a comment about that, Melissa? I don't know. I know here at the school, I was able to open up and switch from teacher to teacher. I don't know if you can do that from school to school. I, I've never had anybody ask me that. Yeah. Uh, typically, it's school specific, from my limited experience, but uh, it's certainly something you could you could ask. It's great. Um, so let me also answer Tammy Wagler. I said, Milady has a course management guide that can be purchased uh, that includes lesson plans and supplemental materials. Karen is at Wilkes Bar area CCC. And uh, Kathy, did, Kathy, did you want to make a, a couple of comments? I know you've made a, uh, a couple of uh, question box responses. Kathy Houghton, did you want to mention something you said about permission required for Moodle um, sites? Yeah. I believe for the for the Moodle, um, I know that within our school here, they're set up as like classrooms um, for all the different programs, and um, you have to become like a. a like you're going to join that class. So I'm going to assume that if you can get into the school's uh, website, you might be able to look at the Moodle um, page, but you have to get like permission in order to join in. So I, I, at least that's how ours is set up. Um, so going from school to school, I'm not really sure how that will work, if you can somehow get permission. To get okay, that's a good comment. Yeah, so again, check with your IT person that it, it may work a little bit differently. I'm going to go back to uh, either Donna or Tracy. I opened up your mic there. Did you have a comment, Donna or Tracy? Okay. Um, we, we just had a question as to why some of you are choosing to use the pivot point over the Milady textbook. Okay. So the question is why using pivot point over Milady? And um, you can either raise your hand or you can put the answer in the question box. But good question. Um, just very quickly, uh, while we're waiting for responses from that, uh, Sue Stewart says uh, she's from Forge Road, PTC, so she, you wanted to add information. Christine, did you have a comment about the question we just asked? Or you had your hand up, or maybe it's been an old reference. I didn't have my hand up, but I was going to respond. The reason why I'm choosing the pivot point is based on it's it's condensed. It's um, I find it easier, and it's the workbook. The workbook has a lot of critical thinking, analyzing, synthesizing. Um, it has all the rubrics in them, and it really you have to see it in order to understand maybe why I personally chose to the pivot point. Sure, Be better to see and understand than to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to switch to uh, Cheryl Olson. Cheryl, did you have a question or comment? Just a comment also about the pivot point um, textbooks. 
I know it's, it's geared towards a younger crowd, lots of pictures, um, and then with the lady rewriting their book um, every so many years and issuing new, you know, a whole new textbook, it's easier to stay with the salon fundamentals because if it's 10 years old, um, they claim that, you know, the information, the basic information is going to stay the same. The pictures may change, but you can still say open up to, you know, chapter two, page whatever, and it doesn't matter how old the book is, it's still going to have the same information on the page. Mr. Keller, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Cheryl. This uh, written comment from uh, Karen McGuire, she says uh, she followed in the footsteps of her previous teacher who used Milady, and she says, I've looked at Milady and thought it was complicated uh, versus pivot points, so maybe some good information for her. Christine, did you have a follow-up comment that you wanted to make? Yeah, I met with the pivot point person, and they said it's strictly built for passing state boards. So I sure. find that to be easier as well. I mean. Obviously, there's a ton of information that you can give that's outside of the textbook based on experience in the salon, but if most of our goal is to prepare them for state board exam. It's completely prepped for that. Okay. Great. Good comment. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to go back to Marsha. Marsha, I didn't mean to uh, take the mic away from you, but did you have any other uh, follow-up comments? I know you want to know about where you can uh, fill in the response form, and we'll go over that in just a few minutes. No, I'm fine. I'm good. I think so. <laughs> okay. Well, Marcia, thank you for sharing what you do. I think that's very, very helpful to everybody here. Um, I, 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 we still want to have your comments and questions, but I just want to ask one more thing before uh, we end today, and that is how you deal with students who are struggling. Uh, so it's one thing to know that students are not catching on to the material, and I'm sure you all have ways of uh, helping students who are struggling with the uh, either the techniques, the skills, or with the content knowledge, are there any techniques or skills that you've used that have been extremely successful or um, highly successful, especially for students who struggle quite a bit with the content? And you can respond either in the question box or by raising your hand. And um, I'm going to go first to Melissa. Melissa, did you want to comment on that, Melissa Chapman? Yeah, um, well, again, I teach the beginning students, and um, I think the theory is, is just so critical for them to understand that first year. So anybody, whether they're special ed or regular ed, if they fail a test, then I meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And really, for some of those students, they need that one-on-one -on -one individual attention or just small group attention. They can't handle, they can't process the information, they can't stay focused in the large group setting for reviews. So for the majority of those students, I found just pulling them aside, and it's a little difficult to take that time away from the skill area, but that's what I have found that has been most successful. And sometimes if it's a large test like the skin, we might take one or two days and break it into a smaller section of, of a test, and they maybe will take 15 questions one day, 15 another day. But that's the one thing I found that works is they need that individual or small group attention. Very helpful. Um, Melissa, I'm just going to ask you one of the questions that Marcia asked. Uh, she said she has a student that cannot make a straight line on the mannequin. I've done connect the dots. I've put marker dots in the mannequin mm. through pictures. Any other ideas that you have or others on the call might have? It sounds like that's sometimes I have to do that, actually draw a picture for them and lay it right beside the mannequin, uh, other than taking a T-pin and pinning it underneath, you know, taking a piece of paper, drawing the line and pinning it underneath the um, hairline. So maybe they can, could see it that way. I, it sounds like she's doing most of the things that I would do as well. Yeah. That sounds like a really difficult case. Yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Let me, let me go to um, Christine, I think Christine. Uh, you had a comment either about just how you uh, help students who struggle or maybe the, the situation that Marcia has? Um, well, as far as Marcia has, I run in that situation a lot and everybody I sound like we're all doing the same thing to try to help them and that's, that's a difficult, that's a challenge as far as straight lines concerned. But as far as helping the students who are struggling, um, I use a ton of pictures and videos 
during my um, lessons, and I really have everything small and chunked out. So it's not a lot of information at one time. And for example, the anatomy section, we'll do the bones, and then I'll just test on the bones, and then we'll go through the muscles and just test on the muscles. So it's chunked out even more. And then I also do a lot of projects, hands-on things, so they're applying the things that they learn. For example, the skin, I make them do a layer construction of the skin um, using food items or whatever they want. So that way they're, because the words are so difficult, especially that first year, they're actually going to apply the vocabulary words by constructing the layers of the skin. And those are just a few things that I use. Great. Yeah, in some of these situations, it, it takes several different things, doesn't it? Sometimes the strategy you think might work may, may, may not work. Very helpful. Thanks, Christine. Let me um, switch down to Sue Stewart. Sue, I've unmuted your microphone. Did you have a comment or something you wanted to add? I unmuted the mic for Sue. Maybe, Sue, you had your hand raised. I don't know if you meant to have raise it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, we'll get back to Sue. Sue, if, you, if, if I missed you and I did that unintentionally, let me know. Um, Melissa asked, what is the layer of construction thing with food would you share? So let me go back up. Was, was that you, Christine, who was talking about that? Um, so I have them, the, the layers of the skin, I have them, whether it's in a box or in a jar, they need to um, use the vocabulary words and construct the different layers of skin, like the subcutaneous tissue from bottom up using, for example, like a food item. It doesn't have to be food item, but it just makes it more fun. And when you're looking at the diagram in the My Lady textbook, I try to make sure that they're using um, to scale it, um, the layers, to make sure that the layers are looking just scaled as they are in the textbook. Maybe using like um, corn pops, for example, as the fatty tissue layer. Just so it's like a somewhat lifelike um, example of what's in the textbook. And then they have to, I have a rubric that I made, they have to label each layer of skin on their model. Now some people use like, I had someone use an um, uh, applesauce jar and they did it inside the applesauce jar. Um, like somebody used the Crisco um, as the fatty layer, so just as long it and it connects it, and they understand. And that's something that they end up not forgetting because they've constructed using those vocabulary words. I hope that helps. Yeah. Melissa, I unmuted you. Did you want to have any follow-up questions to that? Well, would you be willing to share the rubric? You said you mentioned a rubric for? Sure. I don't, how do I put that on there? Um, you can send it to me, and I can give you my direct email address. Uh, I think there's a uh, email address I'll give you at the very end here in just a moment. So if you'll email those, and then I'll you know, email them out to everyone after our webinar today. And you can also put it on the SAS website, which we'll also talk about in just a moment. Great idea. So thank you, Christine, and thanks for the follow-up question, Melissa. We'll try to get those materials to you and to everybody so uh, you're not missing out on any of those. Um, Karen says that's a great idea, uh, Christine, what you were talking about. And Denise says that you can use different colors of sponges that work well too. Uh, Tracy, or uh, maybe it's Tracy or is it or Donna? Um, I've unmuted you there, Tracy and Donna. You said you use a cupcake and icing project to teach the color wheel. Do you want to briefly explain that? Um, what I usually do is I have our service occupation class. They'll bake a whole bunch of cupcakes for me, and then I go to the store and I get various cans of vanilla icing and then I give the students different bowls and then they put icing in it and then they'll do red, blue, and yellow and from those primary colors they have to create the secondary colors and the tertiary colors and again they're in groups and then they're going to icing their cupcakes the colors of the color wheel and then properly place them on a platter and then we take pictures of them for their portfolio and then of course their reward is they get to eat all the cupcakes when they're done. <laughs> That's part. What a fantastic idea. That's great. Uh, I don't know, Christine, if you had, did you have a follow-up question about that or comment? Uh, yes. I also use, um, make them use the primary colors to try to create the level system 
2 through 10, but just by using the primary colors, which is very difficult. Wonderful. Uh, Denise, I, I unmuted your mic. I don't know if you can talk on it or not, but you made a comment that you use, uh, you've done a similar project with Play-Doh. Is that correct? Denise, you may not be able to speak on the microphone, but she said they, they've done this similar project with Play-Doh. Very creative. Wonderful. Um, we are coming close to the time that we're concluding. It's a, it's a fantastic conversation, and I appreciate all the comments everyone has contributed. Uh, we don't want to exclude anyone, so I'm going to give you a few more minutes to add any other questions or raise your hand if you want to make a comment. Um, uh, Denise said she doesn't have a microphone. Sorry, Denise, but thanks for the comment written in. And Melissa says she's done a similar activity with red, yellow, and blue Sculpey. Uh, they make pins uh, with different colors. I am probably not saying that right. Is, is that how you pronounce that, Melissa? Sculpey? Sculpey, right. yeah, and they, they only get red, yellow, and blue, and they have to create different colors, and then they can take the Sculpey, and you wrap it around a um, pen insert, and then you bake it in a toaster oven, and they have a pen that they can use that shows different colors of the color wheel. Wow, that's wonderful. That's great. And uh, Lisa says she also uses Play-Doh. Um, well, we are running out of uh, time here, so I'm just going to ask you if you have any other further questions or comments to add them in. Uh, I'll quickly unmute uh, Bonnie Skinner. Bonnie, did you want to make a quick comment? Yes. Um, I was just going to say I've started with saving my mannequins after the kids have finished with doing the clipper cuts and everything on them. And then they'll take them when we start on the anatomy, and they'll label um, all the different bones, when we do the skeletal system, they'll color code them, and then they'll have them, you know, arranged part on, by the region on it. They do it for the skeletal system, for the nervous system, um, for the muscles, and also for the circulatory system. And that seems to have really helped them to be able to understand that, those, keep those names and know the places by them doing that hands-on activity. Wonderful. That's really creative. Christine, did you want to make a comment about that? Um, well, I do that as well, but another thing that I try to do is um, we're a learning-focused school, so I will give the students uh, learning-focused instructions and make them create an actual lesson plan. I'll give them the topic of what they need to do and that they need to follow the instructions, make sure that students have a graphic organizer, have an essential question, make sure there's... Uh, um, an assessment in the end and have them do a presentation to the class because when they're teaching then they seem to own it more. Now sometimes what I find out is that the group that presented is the group that understands your material more than the rest of the classroom but I still follow up to make sure that they're understanding what it was that I need them to have. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well thank you Christine. Thanks for everybody for your comments. Let me just uh, give you a couple last comments on next steps. Um, as we prepare for the next webinars and as we follow up through today. Um, we will have another discussion of model lessons uh, coming up in February, so it's not too long away. And to make that the most useful, I will be sending out to you just a very short questionnaire, probably three questions to ask you what would be most important to discuss in our February webinar um, about either model curriculum or anything related to curriculum issues that you might be having. And for cosmetology, that will be February 6th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. So I hope that you'll be able to have that on your calendar for us. That's for all the tech teachers, that next slide, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, if you haven't done this already, uh, you can create an SAS account and join the community online and share some of these resources at that website there, that's pdsas.org, very simple website. Go in, if you've not logged in before, it just takes a moment to do that, or you can log in as a guest uh, you do have to kind of scroll into that a little bit to figure out where everything's at. Uh, I think that it's pretty pretty simple to find once you're there. If you have questions, though, uh, just send us an email or give us a short phone call, and uh, we'll be glad to guide you through that process. Um, a couple of you had asked if you could uh, go back and look at the information that you have to answer for the webinar. And let me just go back real quickly to those slides. Here is the, the webinar response form. Um, Put that a little bigger for you to see. Um, it's very simple. It's just three questions, and if you make them in short paragraphs of the takeaway from the webinar, um, your personal response to the topics, and then thoughts and questions for further discussion. That helps these helps us make these webinars most useful and helpful to you. Um, 
that is the essence of our webinar today. Again, we'll have another one coming up in about two weeks in February, again, on model curriculum. If you have any last uh, questions for the group or comments that you'd like, uh, please let me know in the next couple of minutes. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll send all the materials that we've uh, talked about today that everyone has sent to us. And if you have other materials that you'd like for everyone else to share, again, send those to the PAPLC website at meterconsulting.com, and we will share those with everyone else. I guess I should show that. Uh, let me give you that website or that email one more time. It's there right at the, the uh, bottom of your screen, PAPLC at meterconsulting.com. Yeah, thank you all for your patience as we had some technical difficulties at the very beginning. Hopefully we've corrected most of those. I don't see anyone's hands raised, and I don't see right now any further questions. So again, thank you for joining us. Lots of you said thanks for the great resources to all the presenters. Thanks to Donna and Marcia, and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.